Hi, I'm Jess Bennett and I just want to um, apologise initially for the fact that this video is not going to be particularly entertaining I'm afraid due to my lack of technological abilities. So apologies first of all that it does look a bit like I'm either in the jungle or got some plants growing out of my head. That wasn't my intention but it's the best it's going to get I'm afraid. Hopefully what I have to say verbally is going to be of more interest. So we'll see. Um, I'm Jessica Bennett. I have been a counsellor at Priestland School for nine years. During that time I have and continue to work with some inspiring individuals. Students that have displayed resilience even in the face of adversity. I've also worked with pupils that struggle to learn, adapt, change and grow from their experiences. So what's the difference and where's the pattern? Why and how are some individuals able to reach their potential or at least begin to while others find it almost impossible? I don't believe it is simply down to luck or genetics. Instead, there are key factors that determine how helpful counselling can be, or at least how helpful I have been as a counsellor. These are a desire to change, backed by action, hope and belief that change is possible, attachment, secure base, forgiveness and perspective, resilience, adaptability, introspective and a willingness to take responsibility. How do we understand and influence these key factors? A willingness to change and identify unhelpful habits and eventually escape from our, our uncomfortable comfort zones. By this, I mean that realising there is an issue is the first step, but being bold, brave and trusting a counsellor to help you navigate your way into an unknown territory is scary and some people choose to stay stuck. In an environment that is so technologically driven, it's easy to forget that we are not robots. We have feelings, some of which are less desirable, but all of which make us human. Our awareness that we exist, coupled with the knowing that we will one day cease to exist, in our current form at least, depending on our beliefs. What do we do with this knowledge and how do we allow it to filter into our everyday lives can either help or hinder our state of minds. What does it all mean? How do you find and apply meaning to your life? How do you choose to deal with your own vulnerabilities and how do you cope with the unknown and the uncertainty of not knowing how we feel and why? Are you able to be curious about it rather than avoid or fear it? I feel this is where hope, resilience and adaptability come in. Hope that the situation can and will get better and resilience when that doesn't appear to be the immediate case. Adaptability to cope with change, the unforeseen, things not going to plan. I feel these are learnt behaviours and can be taught through parental role modelling. Though through this we gain perspective, or not, on when the situation is something we're able to cope with and to deal with and ultimately survive. Acknowledging our vulnerabilities, but having the hope, resilience and perspective to be adaptable and carry on despite life's challenges. There is also a strong need for secure attachment, introspective and the ability to take responsibility but also to forgive others and ourselves in order to learn and grow from our experiences as imperfect humans. One of the first steps in counselling is acknowledging there is a problem. You don't necessarily need to know what the problem is, but taking responsibility and owning your distress is key. Accepting the reality of how you feel and where you're at, even if it doesn't make sense. You don't have to like it though, and that's where a desire to be active and change comes in. 
I felt some students with parents that struggle to apologise and see their own potential for continued growth and learning find taking responsibility very challenging. The process is immediately harder as there is a need to navigate defences. We are all imperfect humans. That's okay. It's better than okay. It frees us to learn and grow, should we choose to, to forgive ourselves and others for their mistakes. I will now go on to talk about attachment. A secure and healthy attachment to key figures in our lives, whether that's biological parents or not, is essential for children and young adults to flourish and reach their own potential. The powerful message of you are seen, you are heard, you are understood, you are appreciated, and you are loved. There is a theory that if we provide our children with as solid foundations as possible, then they're more likely to reach their full potential. It's referred to as Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it is worth looking at. Basically, it is a pyramid or triangle diagram. And within it are different levels or steps. The bottom level is physiological needs. So physical needs such as food, water, air, sleep, shelter, clothing, etc. The next is safety needs. Examples of these are employment, health, personal security. Then we move up the pyramid to love and belonging. This area includes friends, intimacy, family and a sense of connection. The next level up is esteem, which is about respect, self-esteem, self status, recognition, strength and freedom. The very top of the pyramid is self-actualization, which is a desire and ability to reach your full potential. The idea is that in order to reach your full potential, ideally the parts below this are in place, helping to create a solid foundation to build on. So what can parents do to help children achieve their full potential and create a strong, secure foundation? A really important parental approach is fair and well-explained, consistent boundaries in order for children to feel contained. This inevitably gets harder as children reach teenage years and they may push the boundaries in an attempt to gain more control. There is space for negotiation and it is essential for young adults to feel heard and validated. But the important thing is to consider what they need and what is best for them. And this may well differ compared to what it is they want. For example, youngsters being allowed phones, games or technology in general before bedtime and at night is never a helpful boundary to relax, regardless of the situation. Another is allowing your child time off school due to anxiety, friendship issues or mental health. It is so important to encourage our children to avoid using avoidance. In order to deal with stress, and instead face our fears in order to build resilience. As Carl Jung puts it, what we resist persists. Ignoring and avoiding problems in general, although very tempting at the time, is not a long-term solution to any problem and will only ever make it worse in the long run and slowly minimise individuals' lives and severely reduce their belief that they can cope with stress as adults. In other words, help prepare your child for the road, not the road for your child. I'm going to move on to talk about the label culture. This is a symptom of mental health gone mad. By this, I mean the rise in early diagnosis and labeling, sometimes helpful, but sometimes not. In cases of a diagnosis, as a parent, there is an understandable temptation Sorry, there is an understandable temptation to allow the boundaries to relax. For example, autism, ADHD, anxiety, depression, etc. However, if anything, 
The boundaries are essential in order to help encourage a positive message of, despite this label, I can, rather than because of this label, I can't. This negative mindset removes the responsibility and potential from the child and creates helplessness and a sense of feeling trapped, the opposite of happiness. This applies to any trauma or adver adverse experience the idea that despite this, I can reach my full potential, be happy, not allow it to define me or who I am or who I want to be and create my own solid foundations. I would highly recommend the book, The Whole Brain Child by Dr. Daniel Siegel and Dr. Tina Bryson. They share the belief that when you become the active author of your own life story and not merely the passive scribe of history as it unfolds, you can create a life that you love. I believe we are so powerful and capable of great things if we get out of our own way of happiness and break unhelpful habits, let go of grudges and free ourselves to be happy. I believe each of us has so much potential, but it's up to us to allow it to shine or become extinguished. How we communicate with ourselves and what we choose to focus on creates either a negative or positive mindset. In counselling, I work towards removing judgment of good and bad, freeing us to become curious and instead ask, is this helpful? I'm going to move on to talk about how we deal with disappointment in life and the effect this can have. We feel disappointment from an early age, although too young to name the feeling. Babies demanding their needs are met and protesting when they experience hunger. Toddlers tantrums due to not being allowed the toy in the shop. Children discovering Santa and the tooth fairy potentially aren't real. Or that adults in our lives have the ability to let us down. As adults, how can we change our collection of disappointments or life lessons into growth, learning and adaptability. There are two ways people choose to approach it, either by becoming cynical and using a self-preservation method or assuming the worst in order to attempt to protect from further disappointment with responses such as typical, just my luck, I knew it would go wrong. This reinforces a negative outlook and mindset limiting growth and the potential to see beyond the initial disappointment and instead dwelling on it. The more helpful response to disappointment is acknowledging it, but containing it so that it doesn't become a blueprint assumption that you deserve to be disappointed and will therefore continue to be. A helpful growth mindset in response to disappointment would be, despite what happened in that particular occurrence, not meeting my expectation, it's not the end of the world and I can make it work and hopefully it will improve over time, but I'm not going to let it ruin the rest of my day. By isolating the individual, individual disappointments rather than connecting them all together and feeling overwhelmed, we are more capable of maintaining a positive, hopeful mindset. This is extremely powerful when role modelled by a parent or guardian or any key attachment figure and is the foundation of resilience. I'm now going to talk about control and how our relationship with this either helps or hinders us. Another key factor when it comes to well-being and happiness is people's ability to see what is within their control and what is not. When something angers or upsets us, it's helpful to ask ourselves, can I do anything about this? If the answer is yes, then consider the options. For example, missing the school bus due to running late. Yes, it's annoying and frustrating, but there are things that can be done to avoid it happening in future. So putting proactive learning in place and taking responsibility for setting an earlier alarm or two, if need be, in the immediate scenario, when plan A, which was catching the bus, has not gone to plan, can you show resilience and adaptability by finding an alternative way of getting there? Or do you just give up and not go? 
A less helpful response is playing the blame game as a way of deflecting responsibility. For example, thinking it was the bus driver's fault or the person that walked too slowly in front of you. This response prevents a growth learning mindset and makes it more likely to happen again. Our relationship with control and how we manage ourselves as adults and parents has a profound impact on our children. Role modeling behavior that avoids taking responsibility and accountability, for example, I can't control my anger because I have anger problems, will inevitably trickle down through to your child and promote a sense of helplessness. This relates back to the because of this I can't mentality, which takes control away from the individual. There are always options and always ways of being proactive and helpful yourself and helping yourself more, to name a few, making sure you are getting enough sleep, writing things down to help process what has made you angry or upset, talking to someone about how you feel, whether it's a trusted friend or family member or a counsellor. Eating well and exercising really does help too. Where possible, avoid the blame game as this reinforces helplessness and prevents growth and change. For example, I'm so angry and upset that my partner left that it's their fault that I can't sleep and function properly. Although we can't afford to dismiss the feelings involved of being rejected or someone letting us down, we can't always control this. Whether we choose to continue to feel bitter and hold a grudge is within our control and completely our choice. What is also within our control is whether we adopt this as our new truth or not. For example, I can't be in a relationship as I will always get rejected and let down. This negative assumption can have a profound impact on our future and the impression we give our children about managing ourselves. Holding a grudge takes a great deal of energy and can lead to bitterness and resentment. This leads me on to the idea of forgiveness. Our ability to forgive ourselves and others and embrace the fact that we are all human, not robots, so it is inevitable that we will make mistakes. Forgiving, not the same as forgetting, someone for their actions or words frees us from the burden of bitterness. Likewise, if we are truly remorseful for our own wrongdoings and have worked to rectify any unhelpful choices and genuinely, authentically apologise, then we need to allow for self-forgiveness Otherwise, this can develop into regret. I would highly recommend listening to the podcast, Happiness is a Choice, The Controversial Truth by Mo Gaudet. And that's spelled G-A-W-D-A-T. Mo emphasises the choices we have to be happy and the power of what we focus our attention on and what we are able to let go. Growing older and ageing is inevitable. However, learning from the experiences we have and becoming wiser isn't, but it is a choice. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. The desire and willingness to change is up to us and it can be extremely hard, but the unexamined life is not worth living, meaning that we gain the most from life if we are curious, not judgmental, about ourselves and others and are and seek to adapt and better ourselves. In conclusion then, life will always offer opportunities and disappointments to varying extents. It is down to us as individuals to decide which we choose to focus our attention on more. We have more choices than we realise and more power than we know. As parents, Never underestimate the power of checking in with a loved one. By checking in, I mean asking face to face how they are, really. Even asking, are you happy? It's hard sometimes to take the time to actually observe and see each other, which is why it's so important to have phone free quality time to reconnect and listen. 
another quote from the Whole Brain Child book. There's nothing more important you can do as a parent than to be intentional about the way you're shaping your child's mind. What you do matters profoundly. Remain aware of the daily opportunities to nurture your child's development. Parents and guardians can have more of a positive and profound impact on their child than counselling, therapy, school or any external agency. Ultimately, as parents and guardians, you potentially have the most power and influence over your child. Try not to underestimate the impact you have, your actions, reactions and role modelling. No pressure then. Let's seek reassurance from the same book, The Whole Brain Child, with another quote. Even the mistakes are opportunities to grow and learn. This approach involves being intentional about what we're doing and where we're going, while accepting that we are all human. Intention and attention are our goals, not some rigid, harsh expectation of perfection. As a parent myself, I am flawed. I lack patience and tolerance at times and don't always invest in enough quality time with my children. It's not about hopelessly hitting yourself with a guilt stick. Permission to be human after all. Just be aware, take responsibility and seek to listen, adapt, change and grow, all the while role modelling this, poten this potential. The whole brain child book continues this message to parents. It's not your responsibility to avoid all mistakes. No more than you're supposed to remove all obstacles your children face. Instead, your job is to be present with your children and connect with them through the ups and downs of life's journey. Life can be hard. Not all days are good. But the more we can sympathise and take the time to be there for each other and genuinely show an interest, the better. I'll end with a quote. Life is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be embraced. Thank you for taking the time to listen.